In November of 1862, one of the great scientists of the 19th century, Hermann von Helmholtz, who was one of the important figures in developing the conservation laws in, in physics, conservation of momentum, conservation of mass, etc. Helmholtz gave a lecture at Heidelberg. And one of the issues that he was trying to clarify was why it was that as of 1862, the leading people in science not only had very little to do with philosophy, but were quite visibly shunning philosophers. The question before the house was, how do you account for a divorce between those who a century earlier were living in the same house, doing the same work? The natural philosopher was the natural scientist and vice versa. And here we are in 1862, and you hardly can get a conversation going between members of those two domains. Let me read a passage from Helmholtz where he answers that question, how this all came about. Helmholtz says, he refers here to Hegel's philosophy, Hegel's system. Helmholtz says, Hegel's, quote, system of nature seemed at least to natural philosophers absolutely crazy. Hegel launched out with particular vehemence and acrimony against the natural philosopher and especially against Isaac Newton. The philosophers accused the scientific men of narrowness. The scientific men retorted that the philosophers were insane, close quote. Well, the rift between the esthetes and the men of science was not complete by 1862, but it was certainly on the way to becoming complete. The Romantic movement had made clear, at least to its own disciples, that a mechanistic science was incapable of seeing anything clearly and anything truthfully, and that indeed, if you're looking for some underlying fundamental noumenal reality, you're never going to get it through some reductive scientific scheme based on microscopes, anatomical blowpipes, astronomical tables, etc. You're much more likely to find it in the great productions of art, which is to say, in that manifestation of the absolute that expresses itself through the progressive refinement and beautification and deep sensibilities of a rational and indeed spiritual creature. The world bequeathed by the Romantics is a gift of genius, and this is all taking place within a movement that comes down to us as the aesthetic movement, an original set of ideas. We find it from the middle to the end of the 19th century. The main contributors to the movement include Walter Pater, Matthew Arnold, Anthony Trollope, John Ruskin, later in the century, and wonderfully, Oscar Wilde. Now, the aesthetic movement does not have the 19th century to itself. It is joined by other movements. It's nourished by them, and it nourishes these other movements. One of the salient political facts of the 19th century is that it is a century of reform. It is a genuinely humanitarian century, a century whose major ethicists at the level of public discourse are setting out to remove obstacles to progress, to save people from traditional patterns of oppression. It's a century that's particularly concerned with those in society who are least able to care for themselves, those who have suffered the heaviest burdens of discrimination. Now, many of the reforms were on the inspiration of the Earl of Shaftesbury and other leaders of what at the time were regarded as radical groups. John Stuart Mill's father, James Mill, was one of the one such radical, radical here meaning someone committed to a radical reshaping of society along lines that were argued for and advocated and philosophically bolstered during the Enlightenment and that then materialized in the success of the so-called American experiment, the Constitution of the United States. Have I failed to notice a little something in 19th century America that doesn't quite go along with this? Ah, uh, yes, the institution of slavery. Of course, the anti-slavery rhetoric is among the finest productions of the entire history of humanitarian discourse. The anti-slavery movements in the United States were launched by some of the best minds in the country, Benjamin Rush, for example, who was a signer of the Declaration of Independence, medically educated at Edinburgh, and a famous physician, quite well known for the reform of sanitariums and hospitals. 
Benjamin Rush co-founds the first anti-slavery movement in America with Pemberton. And Benjamin Rush writes passionately about how the crimes we commit against each other, the horrific conduct we behave in toward each other, is matched by things we do to defenseless creatures, to animals. He's making a kind of animal rights speech. Indeed, it is an animal rights speech that if you can harden yourself in such a way as to cause pain and suffering to any creature capable of experiencing it, what's going to discipline you when it comes to exploiting fellow human beings? Well, I say, there's this growing sense that our sentiments of benevolence are our noblest sentiments. That in fact, if the defining feature of human nature is its moral freedom, nothing can be worse. There can be no graver sin than to institutionalize that which denies the very exercise of moral autonomy by others. So we have an anti-slavery movement. I want to say that utterly romantic views of the causes of the Civil War have been successfully defeated by historians, and no one any longer says with a straight face that the only reason there was a Civil War is because right-minded people wanted to put an end to the institution of slavery. But there's a tendency for the pendulum to go too far in one direction when we use our critical scholarly faculties. There is no question but that the moral impulses behind the Civil War included centrally the grave recognition of the sin of slavery as a denial of the very condition on which we would identify ourselves as human beings. When Abraham Lincoln argued more than once that if slavery isn't wrong, nothing can be wrong, he was essentially taking a page from Kant's moral philosophy. Well, the great promise of the Enlightenment was that social problems would admit of scientific solutions. And of course, the great hope of the reform movements was that now, in a scientifically knowledgeable period, with the right methods and the right perspective, with traditional modes of oppression and narrow-mindedness and the like put on notice, or indeed through revolutions it, it, when necessary, we actually could solve problems. And the trick here was to keep our nose to the scientific grindstone, to keep our shoulder to the scientific wheel. Now, there had to be a reaction to this because, in fact, as I made clear in the previous lecture, there was already within Romanticism a recognition that science's understanding of nature is incomplete. It's too narrow. Yes, indeed, the Hegelians might have sounded crazy to men of science, but the Hegelians were already on to something when they insisted that science provided descriptions, provides correlations, it provides correct but rather empty equations. What it doesn't give us is the reason for things. And of course, until we understand the reason behind things, we've understood them not at all. We've understood them so superficially that the understanding is distorted. Now added to this aspect of Romanticism is the recognition that it is through art through beauty, poetry, a commitment to these needs of the soul, that we become ever more aware of our essential nature, and through an understanding of that nature, ever more aware of the kind of world we should be trying to bring about. So the aesthetic movement, as part of the romantic movement, is to supply something widely perceived as having been neglected by science, or beyond the reach of scientific methods and perspectives. There are any number of ways of illustrating the tension, illustrating the competing perspectives here. I find a particularly convenient way to be the review of a speech that Thomas Henry Huxley gave at the founding of what today would be called the University of Birmingham, and then a reply to that speech that would be published by one of the saints of the aesthetic movement, Matthew Arnold. Now, the Scientific College of Birmingham was made possible by a gift of 180,000 pounds from Josiah Mason, a carpet weaver's son who had become quite wealthy. Josiah's industry earned him a fortune, much of it donated to charitable organizations, and for this service he was knighted in 1872. The Birmingham Scientific College opened on October 1, 1880, with Huxley as the featured speaker. It was within the terms of the gift, however, that this new college uh, would not teach, th there would be no classics taught here. Josiah Mason wanted to make a statement. 
and the choice of Huxley for the Founders' Day address could only amplify and give authority to that statement. No classics taught here. Now, Huxley is a great writer, a solid thinker, and a passionate man. Uh, a man who can turn a phrase into almost anything he wants it to be and make it do the kind of work he wants it to do. Well, Huxley gives this wonderful address on science and culture, the place of science in education. And he raises a question that continues to animate discussions of higher education. Consider a student, he says, setting out on a path in life in which he would hope to have some real, practical, worthwhile effects on the world. Now let's say there are two distinct curriculums of study available. One says Huxley, featuring a pair of dead languages, perhaps of some use to a future reviewer of books. And one devoted to the laws and principles, the methods of scientific discovery. Well, Huxley asks, is there anyone who has any doubt about which course should be chosen by that youngster? Of course, the critic Huxley knows he's facing is Matthew Arnold, the great advocate of culture in Victorian England. Thus do we find Huxley referring to Arnold by name. First, he speaks of that toffee set of classics, Dons. He says this about them, quote, They hold that the man who has learned Latin and Greek, however little, is educated, while he who is versed in other branches of knowledge, however deeply, is a more or less respectable specialist's specialist not admissible into the cultured caste. The stamp of the educated man, the university degree, is not for him." Close quote. And then he gets to Matthew Arnold and he says this, I am too well acquainted with the generous Catholicity of spirit, the true sympathy with scientific thought, which pervades the writings of our chief apostle of culture, to identify him with these opinions. And yet, one may cull from one and another of those epistles to the Philistines, which so much delight all who do not answer to that name, sentences which lend some support." Close quote. So for all of Matthew Arnold's Catholicity of spirit, he too belongs to the club of non-Philistines, thanks to what? Well, his classical learning. Then Huxley reads a passage from Arnold's works where culture is defined. Quote, Mr. Arnold tells us that the meaning of culture is, quote, to know the best that has been thought and said in the world, close quote. It is the criticism of life contained in literature, close quote. Arnold and Huxley were friends, and there was a certain amount of tweaking that went on, and uh, Victorian prose writers often bring their essays to the level of an art uh, for the express purpose of tweaking one another. You can't read much in Arnold, Walter Pater, John Ruskin, Macaulay, John Stuart Mill, Thomas Henry Huxley, without recognizing the use of the English language in ways now deader than Latin. Referred to in a public address, Matthew Arnold now has a reason to reply in an essay frequently anthologized and titled Literature and Science. Having been pegged as one of the, quote, Levites of culture by, by Huxley, Arnold begins his reply first by acknowledging that the world of Plato does indeed seem strange nowadays. Here's a quote from Arnold's essay, quote, Practical people talk with a smile of Plato and his absolute ideas, and it is impossible to deny that Plato's ideas do often seem unpractical and impracticable and especially when one views them in connection with the life of a great workaday world like the United States. The necessary staple of the life of such a world uh, Plato regards it with disdain. Handicraft and trade and the working professions he regards with disdain. And these bring about a natural weakness in the principle of excellence in a man so that he cannot govern the ignoble growths in him, but he nurses them." Close quote. You get the flavor of Arnold here. But turning to the challenge laid down by Huxley, Arnold confesses to his own lack of qualifications to debate the point. Quote, I wish to proceed with the utmost caution and diffidence, 
the smallness of my own acquaintance with the disciplines of natural science is ever before my mind, and I am fearful of doing these disciplines an injustice. The ability and pugnacity of the partisans of natural science make them formidable persons to contradict." Close quote. Nonetheless, Arnold is prepared to defend the proposition that a nation's greatest interests may not be secured by a scientific knowledge. Long an inspector of schools for the Crown, Arnold has had ample exposure to what youngsters have been learning. So he passes on this vignette. You want to follow this closely. Quote, I once mentioned in a school report how a young man in one of our English training colleges, having to paraphrase the passage in Macbeth beginning, Canst thou not minister to a mind diseased, turned this line into, quote, Can you not wait upon the lunatic? Close quote. And I remarked what a curious state of things it would be if every pupil in our national schools knew, let us say, that the moon is 2,160 miles in diameter, and thought at the same time that a good paraphrase for Canst thou not minister to a mind diseased was Can you not wait upon the lunatic? If one is driven to choose, I think I would rather have a young person ignorant about the, the moon's diameter, but aware that, can you not wait upon the lunatic, is bad, and that a young person whose education had been such as to manage things the other way be far better off. But then Arnold will rely on one of the greatest of scientists, Charles Darwin, to supply his own want of knowledge. He will focus on a passage found in Darwin's Descent of Man, where Darwin tells us that our ancestor, the ancestor of ourselves, is, quote, a hairy quadruped, furnished with a tail and pointed ears, probably arboreal in his habits, close quote. Granting this much, Arnold concludes that, quote, this good fellow, carried hidden in his nature, apparently, something destined to develop into a necessity for humane letters. Nay more, we seem finally to be even led to the further conclusion that our hairy ancestor carried in his nature also a necessity for Greek." Close quote. Now, we want to understand the profundity of that retort. This is not just Arnold being Arnoldian. This is Arnold saying something about an understanding of human nature, how we ought to explain ourselves. Here are your options. You can do a very careful biological inquiry into the remote ancestry of the human species. Now, if you keep going back far enough, you'll go back to eggs and spermatozoa, and before that you'll go back to genes and DNA. If you keep going back on a particular theory, you come to some sort of slimy primitive soup with all sorts of gook around it and immersed in it. And, and if favoring conditions are right, the humidity, uh, temperature, etc., sparks of lightning, whatever it takes, maybe some of this stuff actually will come together and form a living thing. It, it might have all the attributes of a bacterium or something like that. But if you keep it going long enough, good things might happen. That's one way of understanding the nature of human nature, the scientific reductive way. You start with the primitive soup, and if conditions are favorable and it goes on long enough, good things happen. The way of culture, however, is entirely different. Now we are summoned to examine the achievements of humanity under favoring conditions. Take a look at what it creates when it takes itself most seriously and recognizes within itself a need, a virtual addiction, an addiction based on the proposition that I am not complete ever and that the point of life is the perfecting of life. And I begin to perfect life through examples. Culture provides the examples in the form of statesmen and statues, the Acropolis, poetry, drama, the deep dark mystery of things as conveyed by Euripides, Sophocles, Aeschylus. There must be something in us inclining us to Greek. This isn't a matter of sending boys and girls to school to learn the aorist voice in ancient Greek or a thousand lines of Homer. 
It's not the mastery of two dead languages. In fact, you don't have to learn those dead languages at all. Moreover, rightly considered, those languages aren't dead, and they are not dying. They are the wellspring of the ideas and values that have now been expressed in a variety of languages. The whole point of classical study, Arnold would insist, like the whole point of the aesthetics movement, is not to prepare for the life of a book reviewer, but to prepare for the life of a rational being. The whole point of culture, Arnold says, quote, is to make a rational being ever more rational, close quote and to achieve what Arnold famously refers to as, quote, sweetness and light. Now many have found in that very phrase something so precious actually as to be rather prissy, sweetness and light. I mean, do we take our age in measures that are rather Herculean? And if so, where is sweetness and light figuring in? This is an age of atomic and thermonuclear weaponry, the National Football League, vicious stock transactions on Wall Street. What are we to make of this Arnoldian sweetness and light? One of Matthew Arnold's friends was Frederick Harrison, who was a well-known liberal at the time, political liberal at the time. And he's quoted in one of his political speeches as saying that the reason that the world's attention is focused on England, this is Harrison now, and what makes England so great, Harrison says, is coal. Well, you know that this is precisely the sort of claim that Arnold is going to have a field day with. It's coal. And you find Arnold in another e e essay stepping back and saying, if I understand this right, I paraphrase here, it would be as follows, that if this nation had never produced, and this is Arnold, Shakespeare and Johnson, Marlowe and Milton, if it had never produced John Locke, Isaac Newton, Robert Boyle, if it had never had any accomplishment of this sort to show for itself, but it really had a lot of coal, then in fact Arnold is arguing its standing in the pantheon of nations would be high and untouched. Whereas it could have all these people, but if it didn't have any coal to speak of, there wouldn't be much point in paying attention to it. Coal actually is the basis upon which people like Josiah Mason can make big gifts to support a curriculum that forbids the teaching of Latin and Greek. But again, Arnold speaking for the aesthetic movement says, no, no, it's not coal. It's not even a warm house. That will never do. The utilitarian calculus includes everything except what we're finally prepared to die for, or less dramatically, what we are fully prepared to live for. So that's going to be a central feature of it. And of course, the idea of freedom remains alive and well in this aesthetic movement. Another leader of the aesthetic movement was John Ruskin. His three-volume, The Stones of Venice, had much to do in architecture and art with the revival of the Gothic form and the appreciation of the Gothic. Ruskin also wrote a collection of essays which later in life he says he wished he hadn't written, but I don't think he really wished he hadn't written them. These were titled The Seven Lamps of Architecture. And one of the lamps is the lamp of obedience, where Ruskin raises the question of what an age should do just in case it is found destitute of artistic energy and genius. What should it do? Well, for goodness sake, make pastiches, make, make copies. It, it's better to offer a convincing Acropolis than to enlarge the... MacDonald Arches, for example. Now, in The Stones of Venice, Ruskin urges us to see in the Gothic, the so-called Gothic, which is a derisive term, something long missing in later architecture. If you compare the High Renaissance architecture, you know, the High Renaissance design patterns, these inexhaustible little curlicues and rosettes, they repeat themselves up and down the page. Book pages are marked out with these things. The, the buildings have them. Ruskin sees in this the reduction of workmen to the status of tools. The precise, perfectly repeated pattern is at the cost of moral freedom and human dignity. The decorations themselves reflect what Ruskin calls, quote, the servile ornamentation of the Ninevite, close quote. When you turn from that to the Gothic, something entirely different is conveyed. This freedom in the very imperfection of the thing. 
you actually see expressed the personality of the craftsman. And it's expressed in, in variety and diversity, the imprecision. The whole enterprise has a great summoning harmony about it, but each particular is done by someone who is laboring freely in behalf of what he takes to be a noble enterprise. The noble enterprise might be just celebrity for his guild, but there's a personal element in it. Ruskin then, in his celebrations of the Gothic, is recovering the idea that we are never so authentically ourselves as when at play, and that one of the greatest productions of play is art itself. The authentication of human nature is found in its aesthetic enterprises, not in its mechanical, routine, servile undertakings. One of Oscar Wilde's more devastating epigrams declared that, quote, the birth of America was the death of art, close quote. That's a punishing phrase. This sort of criticism is old hat, of course. And at least in the matter of painting, it has been utterly overtaken by the world of art in the 20th century. But what Wilde was pointing to is the conflict between the idea and the practical, between the world of spirit and the world of things. A more discerning critic of America, and we now would use this good and great name to represent nearly all that passes for progress in today's world, was again Matthew Arnold. He, he wrote two lengthy essays on culture in America. One was published before he had ever visited the United States. The second following a tour of the states in which he was wined and dined at the White House and other eminent places, otherwise lionized as the ultimate arbiter of high culture. In his last words on America, he rehearsed a judgment made earlier by Sir Lepel Griffin, made in print by Lepel Griffin, who was an officer for the Crown in India. And he had toured the United States, and he wrote an article in which he complained that of all the countries in the world, a gentleman would least want to live next to Russia would be the United States. Arnold attempts to understand this appraisal. Griffin comes, he says, from just that class of people you would consult to determine where gentlemen would like to live. So what is it that Lepel Griffin found missing here? And Arnold does a very interesting analysis, not a Tocquevillian analysis. He, he even mentions Tocqueville and says, I'm not a systematic thinker. You turn to Tocqueville for that. But he does perform a quite interesting service to us when he says, look, no people ever had political institutions that better matched themselves than the United States. The political problem is solved. It's the right form of politics for people like that. You, you can't improve on that. He doesn't see much poverty in America during his tour. He doesn't think poverty amounts to much here because this is a country where you can turn that around overnight. To a very considerable extent, he thinks the social problem has also been solved here, at least during his visit. At least it's not going to be plagued by class wars. But he says, we have not solved the human problem. And what Sir Lepel Griffin is getting at is this, he says, America doesn't listen to the critics. It's already the most powerful country in the world. It can protect itself. It's vast. It's rich. It's getting bigger all the time. The problem is this. The problem with America, Arnold says, is not one of power, wealth, or politics. The problem is, quote, it isn't interesting. And he says the reason the United States is not interesting is this, quote, what makes a nation interesting is its capacity to inspire awe, which it does chiefly through the creation of beauty. And until America makes itself awe-inspiring by an attachment to beauty, it will remain uninteresting, and therefore the gentle spirit will not find a home there. America can stand up to criticism sharper than this, needless to say. But the world at large will always be seen by the esthete in terms and measures that the ruler and the butcher's scale miss entirely. It is a great idea in philosophy to urge a fundamental connection between truth and beauty. Socrates suggested just that connection, and the esthetes raised it to a religion. It probably is a religion perilously worshipped, but it's surely one to which we should accord great respect and find in it a rather dangerous criticism of what seems to be an almost passion for vulgarity.